Let me give you another example. Imagine there are about what? 40 people here, okay? Tomorrow we are going on a picnic, okay? Okay. So we are all in this bus, all of us, 40 of us. We have our mitai, we have our chai, we have our, our pakora, we have our sweets, we are going on a picnic. And we've got a wonderful driver. The bus is going, all of us very happy, partying, enjoying. We are going to the mountains. We are going to see the Himalayas. We are going to Kashmir. Okay. So up we are driving and Dr. Umer is a very good driver, very disciplined, very responsible, very experienced. Okay. So we, we trust him that he will take us to where we are going. Okay. So as we are going, the bus is going up and up because a mountain, right? Mountain, you've seen how mountainous roads are like this, like this, to go up. So we are going. We are the passengers, we are having, having a good time, we are telling stories, we are listening to music, we are doing all kinds of things and our driver, Dr. Umer, he has to focus on the road. He cannot join the party at the back, he cannot turn his back to see what we are doing, he has to look in front, right? So, we are going. Suddenly, the driver, the brake fails and you are going uphill we don't know anything but he's he's a driver he knows he's trying to apply the brake and nothing is happening and he's trying to control a bus and very slowly the bus is going backwards because the brake has failed okay and now he is trying to lose he's getting nervous and losing control okay let me stop here so, imagine we are in that bus, he the driver, all of us now we realize that this could be very dangerous, right? It's a mountain, there's a ravine on both sides and the bus is going backwards and he's trying to control it. What's going to happen? What do you think will happen? First is the passengers. Imagine the behavior. Each one of us will behave differently. This gentleman is very smart. He will say, you know, don't panic. We'll be fine. This gentleman, he said, oh my God, my children, they will never see me. The other one will say, that's it. We're going to die. They are screaming at the back. They're crying at the back and here, Dr. Umer is trying to control the bus. So here's one very specific situation that can be interpreted in a variety of ways. So you bring a sociologist, he's going to study the context and the behavior of each one of them in relation to the group and the context. You bring an economist, he's going to look at the people, he said, oh, the bus is too old. Too cheap. Blame the company. So if you begin to study this specific situation in its context, some people will start blaming the driver. I told you, take, take the other driver, take Mahmoud. You took. So everyone will be behaving differently. One specific situation, one context, all of us together, but Try to interpret the situation and you will find a lot of interpretation, a lot of behavioral outburst, emotions, all kinds of emotions, everybody from anger to desperation. What are we going to do? We are all going to die. Okay, so here is a context. So you need to understand the context. Then you need to understand the behavior of the people, how are we going to behave in a particular situation? Each situation is different, okay? I gave you a hazardous situation where there's hazard. So when there's hazard, you also have emotions, okay? Emotions, anger, all kinds of emotions will uh, come up. 
So it's a hazardous, it's a perilous situation. Okay? So understand that when you're doing research, therefore, you've got to understand the context. And then, so again, going back to Berg and Lachman in the social construction of reality, he, both of them, Berg and Lachman, they, they, they are telling these kind of contexts, these are kinds of stories, essentially giving us indications of how to go about studying human behavior in a particular context, in a particular situation. And I'll come back to situation in a minute. And then another very important piece of study by Marvin Harris. Marvin Harris was an anthropologist, very good anthropologist. And uh, his method to study, he spent his entire academic life is studying groups, is studying human behavior. A white American, a white guy, and he wanted to study the behavior of black people. Okay? So, the professor, you go to places, you know, whether it's Africa or whether you go to Holland in New York where you've got a you know, large population of black people. He wanted to study specifically why black people behave in certain ways. You are Professor Marvin Harris. How are you going to do that? So I give you your subject matter. Here's your population. You are going to study the behavior of black people. How are you going to do it? What method are you going to use? Are you going to give a questionnaire? and ask all the black people on the train, why are you black, where you come from, what do you eat, they will ask you to go away. Are you going to interview them? Hey, hey mister, give me five minutes, please answer these questions. I am doing a study on black people. He will, they will tell you, go away. So, how are you going to do it? They're going to, what is, you know, your, how are you going to design your sample? So Marvin Harris, he decided if he really wanted a good objective analysis, a good objective interpretation of his study, you know what he did? He painted himself black. Everything, his hair, afro, painted himself black everywhere. Top to bottom, he changed his look completely. When you see him, you wouldn't say, this is Professor Marvin Harris, a white American professor. And he took, you know, broken shoes, ragged clothes. He went to Chicago. And he started to live with the black people in the streets, in the neighborhood, and he spent time with them learning their language, learning how to speak like them. Yaman, yeah, what are you doing? Learning their language, learning their behavior, learning how they eat, learning their songs, learning their habits. He started he became one of them. And this is called ethnography. Ethnography is the process, the study of human interaction. Okay? Becoming a participant, more than a participant observer. You are immersed in the situation. You are immersed as part of your research. That's how serious academics, that's how serious some people take their research. He painted himself black in order to get the data he wanted. Okay? And uh, he spent weeks. And I would highly recommend you read his book. And the title is Black Like Me. And if you are a student of sociology, if you are a student of anthropology, and if you've never heard about this book, then I am very sad. 
Here's your foundation. These are the foundations of your discipline. You are in anthropology, you are in sociology, you are in economics, but these are the foundations of how to conduct research in your particular discipline. And then I talk about, let me talk about the third very, very important piece of work by Irving Goffman and the title of the book, Asylums. Irving Goffman, a psychiatrist by training, and he wanted to study prisoners. He wanted to study prisoners. He wanted to study mental patients, people with psychiatric disorders. Asylum, and again, when I was a student in London, it was one of the textbook, key textbooks we had to study. And uh, to this day, I quote them, look at that, 50 years later, I'm talking about asylum. So, if you look at their approach, how they approach their discipline, how they approach their study, how they frame their methodology, how they approach their entry into the field. That's the preparation you need as researchers, as students undertaking research. You need to have field preparation before you enter the field to start your field work. You, your field work will not be useful your field work will not be very strong until you've had the preparation to be able to enter the field you need to be prepared to go out in the field then you will have the data that you're looking for so entry to the field is not just printing a list of questionnaires putting them in your suit bag and then you up you go in the village in Punjab, in Balochistan, and you go and distribute people and you write. Before you do that, you need to understand your context. You need to understand the people you are studying. You need to know the environment. You need to test whether this is the right method for the study you're doing. Questionnaire, is it the right one? Should I do survey? Should I use, I don't know. You need to understand the subject matter. Why are we, you know, Goffman was studying prisoners. His subject matter, the prisoners. And before he actually went into the, he became a prisoner. Got permission and he got himself in prison among prisoners to be able to understand the behavior of prisoners. Okay, so that ha that's how seriously you are talking about quality research. You are talking about research that is really of quality research that will prove a certain point. Research that will contribute to knowledge. Then entry into the field, you need to know precisely where you are heading and what are you doing. Context, the situation. And this is called, it's called interpretive sociology. It's called interpretive behavior. And this came from the German sociologist called Max Weber. Have you heard about Max Weber? Yes? Ah, Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so, Max Weber, one of the founding fathers of sociology, and of the social sciences, I must say, if you look at his theory of interpretive behavior, so Berger and Lockman, social construct and reality, Irving Goffman, asylums, Marvin Harris, they all used the approach developed by Max Weber. 
So if you want to understand what is interpretive sociology, what is interpretive behavior, and if you are going to study people, you are going to study you know, communities, you are going to study mountain people, you are going out there studying criminals, you are going out studying drug addicts, whoever, there are some very important questions that you need to understand. You need to prepare yourself. What is your background? Have you got the right background to be able to go there? And now I'm going to mention another study. <clears throat> Have you heard about the book called Middletown? Middletown. Nope. Again, if you are in sociology, anthropology, psychology, Middletown, that was a series of studies done at the University of Chicago. Very, very important to this day because of the methodology they used to study things like poverty, malnutrition, community development, crime, deviancy. If you read them, then you get an idea how they prepared themselves, how they designed their study, how they constructed their instruments, the sample, how did they design the sample, how did they select the sample, using from primary sources to secondary sources, all the things that you have taken in your course on research methodology. And you'll see visually how they conducted the study. And to this day, these are classic work in the area of research methodology in the social sciences. So unless you have, unless you know some background, it will be very, very difficult for you to uh, comprehend what you are doing. Because remember, if you are a chemist, a physicist, okay, if you're a scientist, A scientist, the methods a scientist is going to use is very different. For the scientist, if the scientist wants to study why water evaporates, the scientist will have to take water. The scientist will have to put a flame, let it boil, he will observe, he will measure all these things happening in front of him in the lab. He will, he's going to record everything, right? That's how research is done in the natural world, where you, have, you can measure, where you can see, where you can observe, where you, you can control. If you add more water, it's going to take longer. If you use a different vessel, this is glass, if you use copper, the reaction will be different. So you can, it's called controlling your subject. So you can control it. So if you look at the natural environment and how the physicist or the scientist is using his subject matter in the lab, he has absolute control of what to do with the subject. He's got his equipment, they're all wired up, he can control up, down, increase temperature, pressure, whatever. If you are an anthropologist, can you control, if you, let's, say, let's say you're studying tribal behavior, how are you going to control them? Can you press, press a button and everybody will start dancing? You press another button, everybody will start to cry. You press another button, everybody will say, well, food, 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 we are hungry. It doesn't work that way because your subject matter is people like us. We are different. You cannot put us in a lab and control us. And you know why? Our mind, you can't control. You can put me in the prison, but you can't stop me from thinking about my family. You can put me in the prison, you can take away all my freedom, but you cannot take away my power of thinking, right? You cannot take away my emotion. I will cry when I want to. You cannot force me unless you beat me up, okay? 
So you cannot force me to laugh if I don't want to. So human beings, we are very sophisticated because we have emotions. We can cry, we can laugh, depending on the situation. We suffer pain, we suffer hunger, we suffer, you know, all those things. It's discipline. You know, when we hear the Azan, it's Salah time, we leave everything. It's not like the lab you can control. You can t tell people, hey, hey, don't, don't go. They will turn your back, they are gone, right? So this is human behavior. You cannot control human behavior the same way a physicist is controlling his subject matter.